Thanks for being here, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and screen share. And we are going to talk today about pitching yourself and pricing your work. We'll do a simple overview of pricing your work and We'll get into that a little bit more when we get to that section, but I am Samantha Meyer. I am the Director of Experiential Programs for Grady College, help students meet that EL requirement that we have for all of our undergrads, as well as share industry information and help get students connected to industry employers and alumni. And I am co-presenting today with Dane Young, and I will let Dane introduce himself. Thank you, Samantha. Thanks for putting this together. It's a joy to be here. I'm Dane Young. I'm a PR specialist at Grady College, also an alumnus of the college as Samantha is uh, an alumna. Uh, I graduated in 2011 and worked in local TV for five or six years. And uh, for about three years, I've been back as a PR specialist. So when you see news stories go on our website, when you see tweets go out from our UGA Grady account, which you should be following if you're not, same with Instagram at UGA Grady or our LinkedIn pages, we manage all of those accounts. I consider myself uh, a storyteller of the storytellers. And uh, so that's what me and uh, my boss, Sarah Freeman, do in our Office of Communications. In uh, part with this series, though, on the side uh, of the work that I do for Grady College, I am also still a sports reporter for UGASports.com, which is the Georgia Bulldogs athletics uh, website on Rivals.com. And so I still do sports reporting, uh, football coverage. Uh, we have a show every day or every game day during the season. So uh, I freelance on the side and have my main job at the college. So this is uh, exciting and thanks for having me. Awesome. And Dane, I will ask you to watch the waiting room if that's okay. I think we had some people pop in and I'm also screen sharing. So can't do too And So thank you. Thank you, co-host. Um, fabulous. Okay, let's go ahead and get started started here. So here's what we're going to talk about today. Um, quick overview of what we'll be discussing, um, utilizing your network, harkening back a little bit to session one, knowing your audience, we'll show some examples. And like I said, that simple overview of pricing your work. But um, Dana and I talked, we're both pretty casual presenters. So we'll, you know, share info as we have it. But if you all have questions, please feel free to use the chat. We'll keep an eye on it. Um, raise your hand, however you wanted to do that in Zoom, but we're open to doing that. I think not just saving the Q&A until the end. So please feel free to do that. You know, we'd love to hear from all of you. So in terms of utilizing your um, network and social media, it can be hard to do a cold pitch to an editor or an executive. And by cold pitch, if you haven't heard that, that means you are emailing someone from the internet. You may not have met them before. You just found their email. That can be scary and you want to be sure you're cutting through. So the more people you have in your network and that you can say you met them through someone else or that person passed along your information, the better. And you also want to let opportunities come to you a little bit. So, you know, look out for people that might be asking pitches, asking for pitches or freelance work. Um, follow editors individually on social media. And I just did a quick search on Facebook and LinkedIn and a ton of freelancing groups popped up. So join those and make um, these types of opportunities come your way naturally in your social um, network as, as you're scrolling. So keep that in mind that it's not all about that cold pitch look for opportunities as well. Look for people that are asking for pitches and think back to session one tips, take the time to build your network. I think there will be a lot, you hear this a lot, it doesn't matter what topic we're talking about. We tell you to get plugged in, get connected um, with alumni. And I think that will really help when you're thinking about pitching. And I do also want to note that we ended up doing one session um, for all of our majors. We didn't do the breakout rooms this time. A lot of what we're sharing will be able to be applied across all of our majors, regardless of the type of freelance work you're interested in doing, the type of pitching you're doing. There are some differences that we will talk about as well. So feel, feel free to ask us any of those questions. Note the differences too in the different social media platforms, because some are going to feel more invasive than others if someone that you don't know is trying to follow you. So put yourself in the position of that editor that is being reached out to or a potential hiring manager or professional of any kind. I would say in general, 
it is totally appropriate for people on LinkedIn to reach out with someone that they don't know. That's what that platform is mainly for. If it's someone's private Instagram page and they have the little lock on there, probably means that they want that privacy for a reason and it may not be the best outlet. Uh, in terms of my background in media and reporting, Twitter tends to be a space where people in that industry speak to each other, but it's not always that case for maybe advertising and PR or maybe um, entertainment and media studies with directors and movie producers and things like that. So just go to their feed if it's public and look to see how they're interacting with others and that can kind of give you an idea of, okay, is this appropriate or not to do this on this channel? I'm really glad you said that. Thanks for sharing that. And I was definitely thinking about Twitter, even though it's not actually on the slide, but you're right. That is definitely really common on the journalism side. So for any students that are interested in journalism and I'll say print or photo or, or even digital, I've seen just from following journalists and editors on my own on Twitter that they'll even say DMs are open for pitches, reach out. So Twitter is really common for that. So seek out people, not just the publications themselves, but individuals that you really like their work um, on Twitter as well. So continuing that, you have to also know your audience. So some of that is following the publication and people who work there or the organization itself. If you're more on our ad PR, graphic design, web design side, there might be clients that you're seeking, follow organizations that you might want to work with. But again, you really have to know who you're talking to and if your work is going to be a good fit. I think this is especially the case on the journalism side, photo side. You need to know who you are pitching and if the project or um, the story will really fit with the tone and, and the type of work that they're typically producing. So in terms of understanding their need, um, you know, see, especially on the business side, is there a business need that maybe you can help them meet? And we'll talk a little bit more about this on the next slide, but you need to be able to know what the need is and show how you'll meet it. This is really similar to the things I tell you all about writing a cover letter for a traditional internship or nine to five. The difference is that you don't necessarily have a job description to go off of. And that's what we tell you to do for the cover letter. So you have to do a little bit of your own research, which we'll talk about in the next slide, but you should have a good understanding of who you're speaking to. And I think that someone will probably be able to tell if, you don't understand their publication or their business or, or what they do. So you want to position yourself off the bat as an expert. And that's at a micro level for an organization, um, a macro level, excuse me, for the organization. For a micro level, once you get to the individual person that you know that you need to make a connection with, that's when your skills, I, I equate it to being in an elevator and someone gets on and you start using your context clues. Okay, the shirt that they're wearing, uh, I see that bag tag that meant they've traveled to Dallas sometime. In recent. That's when you start investigating, but you can do that online with their LinkedIn. And so if there's someone that you've talked to and all of a sudden, you know, oh, they used to work at this publication in this town that I grew up in, then all of a sudden you have a starting point for a conversation. Uh, and anytime that you can talk to someone about themselves and their history, they're going to be impressed by that. Fantastic. So in terms of knowing your audience and doing your research, I would recommend before you send an email, and this is making the assumption that a lot of this will be happening on email. Some of this may also be a follow-up after you meet someone in person, but this idea of your pitch and I'm speaking about an email when I'm saying that, build an hour into getting all of your work together in addition to the actual details about the project. So that might sound like a lot of work, but here's what we mean when we say that. Looking at if it's a publication, what do they cover? What's their tone, sections and beats that they have? And are they missing coverage or not having a conversation that you, uh, you know, that you can fill in with the work that you are pitching to them? And in terms of, again, more on this marketing, not just on the journalism side, based on what you see, what service or skill can you then offer? So for example, did you notice that their search results might pop up low on Google? And surprise, you do freelance SEO content writing. Now, you might not want to necessarily tell them in the pitch that you saw how low they are on the Google rankings, but you can still offer the service and they probably are aware um, of that. But look, you have to know again, um, who you're who you're talking to and again how you might fill that need and be a really great fit for them so for our entertainment folks that are watching or, or tuning in later 
Um, knowing your setting is important. And I say this because you might be more likely of, of all of our majors to be able to pitch on the fly at something like an industry event. It might even be something that happens and that's put on by the college, but you have to know when it's appropriate to pitch or not because networking and pitching are not necessarily the same thing. So you might meet someone at a networking event and that's great. Maybe you get their business card, you connect on LinkedIn and you're just starting to know people. But like Dana is saying, kind of reading the context clues of the conversation, if you, you say, oh, I'm, I'm a screenwriter and they say, well, what are you working on? That, that's an opening for you to give a pitch. But if someone is just like, oh, oh, that's great. And then they kind of close the conversation. They don't ask more questions. It either might not be what they do or they've, they've got to go. Don't just be ready for a pitch. Don't bring hard copies of a screenplay, for example, but you need to be ready to go. So you might not be sitting down to do the emails the way that some of these other majors might be. But if you have a specific project you're working on, especially um, some of our screenwriters, and I know we had a lot of students who attended session one that were interested specifically in screenwriting. If you've got something you're working on, be able and ready to talk about it, but you're not always going to offer it up. So know the setting, but be ready is what, is what I'll say um, for that, for those industry opportunities. Samantha, I love your example there with uh, Google and the SEO content writing because it's salesmanship, right? What is a gaudy car to one person is a way to stand out to another. And so when you're having that conversation, you wouldn't say, oh, I saw you were awful at Google and I'm good at it. So you need to hire me. No, that's going to be terrible. Right. You have to say, hey, I'm, I'm really good at Google. Here's some of the results that I've had from some previous projects. Uh, and I'm just thinking this could be something that based on what you already do, it could accent and really help get that out there more. Absolutely. Yes, great point. We, you do have to sell yourself. That's really what pitching is. Selling yourself, knowing what you do, what you're good at and how it's going to help um, help the people that you're trying to work with. So in terms of showcasing your work, I don't want to get too into the weeds with portfolios. That's a whole separate one hour meeting that we can talk about, but it is important that you do have your work gathered, that you have already done it and completed um, even results if you can show them. I will give you all listening the heads up um, and the tip that Whitney Denny and the Career Center and I are partnering with Wix this fall. And um, Wix is going to do a portfolio workshop for us in October, and this is for fall 21 for anyone who might be listening in the future, um, but we're hoping to partner with them regularly. They're going to talk about what should be included in a portfolio that will be good regardless of the platform you use. They'll walk us through Wix a little bit, and I hear there might be a promo code for anyone who attends, so we'll just give you the tip on that. So look out for your email for info on that Wix workshop. But again, the important point is that you've got your work gathered somewhere that you can share with someone, share that link with someone in a pitch and even on your resume if you're going for these more um, traditional roles. Um, during the pitch, mentioning your previous work and expertise, especially in any niche areas or niche topics that you really know a lot about and for a script specifically, and, and this could even be for photo projects as well, design projects, Tell your vision and the type of work you do concisely in a really compelling way. So we're going to actually show a screenwriting pitch example of the four main components, but it's not a long droning on, you know, opportunity. It's very similar to an elevator pitch that we talk about when you say like you're going to a career fair, um, but it's a pitch for that particular project that, that has to be concise, a few sentences and, and really tell the vision. You have to be able to you know, get the buy-in from people in that concise way. Be creative with the outlets where these portfolios are too, because one thing that we hear from alumni all the time, especially the ones that are a little bit older, oh, I wish I had so many outlets or so many opportunities to be able to show off the work that I was doing because, you know, for TV back then, it was going to be four local stations in each city. That was going to be it or radio or however you want to go. Uh, movies may be even tougher that you couldn't do any of that in Georgia. Well, now you can do all that on your phone and then put it on an account, uh, yours or another, that uh, is a social media platform and then try to connect with other people that way. There's really no excuse anymore not to have something in your portfolio to show I've published this, even if it's on my own channel. That's exactly right. Okay, let's get into some examples. and Let's make sure. Okay, so we're going to 
look at a pitch to an editor and why it works. And then this same resource also has a content writing pitch and why it works. So we will pull this up and this will be one of the many resources that we share after. The reason why I like this example is because it showed the pitch itself and then it also showed responses from the editor with information, you know, redacted where appropriate, which I thought was really great. So here's an example for a men's journal online. So, you know, Diana herself was actually writing and saying, um, here's what, telling a story. I was on this trip a few weeks ago. So I thought that you might be interested based on this idea I had. Here are previous examples I've written um, for you all in the past. And here are, here's a link to a relevant piece that they're already covering and giving a little bit more detail and really showing a lot of expert, expert knowledge on a topic. So you're not just emailing someone and saying, I'd really like to write for this men's journal that you have, you're pitching an actual idea. So you have to do work beforehand. Now, there might be some opportunities where people have a call for a general pitch, and th that will really just be dependent on if you happen to see that. But more often than not, an editor is expecting um, a photo project, a story idea, basically already crafted. Now, you can see that there will be a response where um, they're saying that they'd be interested in more of a roundup rather than maybe a deep dive. So they're, the editor is doing the job of an editor of saying that's a good topic, but here's how it will fit into our publication. So it will be a roundup versus something else. Does it work? It did work. They confirmed your rate, work out all the details, and that was quick and simple. Um, here is, let me find the content one. So this is more um, for a brand freelance quiet client. So this was, and subject line is important. We'll talk about that. That's, that's a best practice, have an eye-catching subject line. So here's an intro to experience content marketing writer, magazine writer. So here they're talking about, um, you can see they did their research that they won first place in the competition. So Diana recommends that it's important to include something recent and of note about the company that you're pitching or that they saw on the website. So that's where some of that research goes in. She obviously did her research before she was sending this pitch. So this is a little bit more gener general of inquiring about whether they use freelance writers and she does content marketing writing. So she's talking about that talking about what her focuses are specifically, clients she's worked with in the past. Might be some time before you can mention some of that if you're just starting out, but that will be helpful. Note the general length of these emails. They're not super long, mm -hmm. but they do include the links within there to get to portfolios for more information. And that's for multiple reasons. I can tell you from being a journalist in local TV, we would get two to 300 emails a day from the different lists that we were subscribed to, both locally and nationally. Uh, and then working at a PR firm, which was my job before coming to the college, um, we would send out pitches like this for our clients to try to get those stories placed in media. Uh, and so those inboxes get full really quickly. And if you can show that it's tailored and personalized to that person, your intended audience, you're going to have more success, but also they're very busy. And in a lot of cases, they may be scrolling on a phone to see uh, you know, what's going on here. So you can't have seven, eight, nine paragraphs. It needs to be short and sweet and concise, but still have the content that you need in there. So they don't have to ask you so many follow-up questions. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a really great point. They're all nice and short. So yeah, linked out to portfolio and you can see the response. So they're talking about, yes, they do work with freelance writers. We're always looking for these types of articles what's your rate. And then the thing I like about this too is then based on that, you can see the article um, from the pitch that ended up actually being assigned. Um, so they ended up working on um, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, and how it can help solve sleep problems. So with that general pitch of I have worked, you know, with health and that's one of my areas, that's some of what they ended up um, 
able to, to work on. So short and sweet, um, positioning yourself as an expert and having a project ready to go based on knowing the type of work that a publication will either publish or that on the content writing side for a brand that is probably going to fit into um, what works for them. And if you can answer their questions before they ask them, it just makes life so much easier. And so the very basic questions is going to be, who is this person? What can they do? And what have they done? And if you can explain that in the you know two to three paragraphs with links that you can, then you've got a good shot. Absolutely. And I will note, again, we're going to talk about pricing yourself later in the presentation, but you can see from these conversations that Diana was sharing that that is a conversation that ends up happening. It's not happening in email one, the same way that we're not negotiating salary and your first round interview for a, you know, a permanent full-time job, for example, it does need to be part of the conversation and it is part of that pitching you know, conversation over time, but that's not one of the first things we're starting with. So just, just a quick note on that. That's kind of a faux pas, like when you're in the process of asking for the first date, declaring right then and there that, all right, we're gonna split this meal, right? Like, then it gets awkward at that point. Just don't do it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. The time and a place you know, and, and, and wait for it. So this is a really great article about networking and pitching at uh, pitch festivals, film festivals, industry events. Um, but there is specifically um, the elements that you want to have prepared before you even find yourself in, in one of these events. And that's exactly what I was talking about earlier for those of you in entertainment that might be able to um, pitch on the fly, you want to keep it concise. This, these are the elements that you want to have prepared, but you want to have it ready to go. You don't want the first time that you're saying this to someone to be at this industry event when it's someone that you might want to work with. So you do have to um, put some time in ahead. Even if you're not doing these types of emailing, you know, we're talking about, you might have the opportunity to rise for you. So I like that they use an example we're all familiar with. They use JAWS um, to show how this works. So you want to hook an extended log line, a comparison to films that already exist, and then a really good finish. Some of you might have already thought about this. For those of you that haven't, you know, do hope that this is helpful. But you can see that the hook is imagining a tourist island that's ravaged by a great white shark that nobody can catch. Your extended log line is giving a little bit more detail. So my script is called Jaws. You've got your title. It tells the story of a gigantic great white shark that begins, you know, doing this. It's a slasher flick meets Moby Dick. And then your great finish. Here's how it ends. Boom. So short and sweet. And of course, I'm reading it as someone who did not write the screenplay for Jaws. So you want, might want to work on your tone. You don't want it to sound too rehearsed either. But you want to show that you know the story, what it's about, and be able to um, explain your vision. Okay. With any kind of pitch like that, you want to make sure that you have energy in how you're pitching it to show that you're passionate about it uh, and that it's not something that you've had sitting around for three years, that you're really invested in it in that moment. Um, so work on that. Like one of the old TV tricks we had was practice in the mirror, how you want to look or turn your phone around and record yourself doing that pitch beforehand, because that fine line between energetic and too rehearsed, you have to strike it where you're comfortable there. Um, but if you don't have energy, then the person you're pitching won't have energy either. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And there will probably be questions that end up um, coming up after that. And so there's a really great list here of questions that you might want to be prepared for. I also like this last point about controlling your emotions. I think it can be really hard for any project. I, I think in person definitely comes up an email that might not be as easy to just kind of spout something off, but, you know, be aware that, um, it's something that you, you've worked really hard on, especially something like a screen pay, screenplay, one of those longer term um, projects. Um, everyone might not love it. That's okay. Um, don't get too defensive about it. Don't defend it. Let, let the work in the pitch speak for itself. And I think that goes for photo projects when you're submitting photos, for example. Um, that's something that kept coming up, especially for those types of projects and creative projects. Let the work speak for itself. Um, for a writing project like this can be a little bit harder to do. And that's why the pitch is so important because um, you're not necessarily, you haven't necessarily created it yet. So, and, and put the visuals to it. So um, be able to, to sell that story. 
because in a lot of cases what might happen is they may not like the story but they may like you and then there's mm-hmm. your your point of entry into like okay well let's try something else later on right absolutely so for fit- pitching a photo project i want to show um this one section here about the essentials it's basically all the W questions, who, what, when, where, how, and why, your essential checklist. So here's a list of questions that will be helpful for you to keep in mind um, as you're crafting your pitch for a photo project on, on the photojournalism side. But bearing in mind, you are not going down this list and making sure there's an answer to every question in your pitch because we still want to think about what Jane mentioned earlier short and sweet, still getting the information out that's needed for the pitch to really catch their attention, but not bogging them down because there's going to be so many um, emails that they're probably sifting through as an editor. So talking about who you are, talking about a project that you've done specifically, um, is there anything important related to this project? Not just print, but is it, is there a gallery launch that you're doing? Um, a book that you you're working on, anything like that. Um, but this is points to what Dane is talking about for these projects as well. An editor has shared that if they get the feeling that the photographer really loves the work that they do, it's likely to leave a strong impression. So not just doing the work, but being able to talk about it and share that vision and that passion with other people who might not know you yet because you're still building a name for yourself is really what's important. So, and exactly what Dane said again, ideal email is on the shorter side, but it also needs to tell the story. So don't be too short that they don't have a sense of who you are and what the project will be. So again, you can see that a lot of this, regardless of the type of work, regardless of the major and what subset of the industry, a lot of these pitching details are going to be pretty similar um, and a best practice. And I also want to get back to the PowerPoint here. And- I, I will say from my experience, the, I guess the, the talent that you can provide, they're definitely interested in that. They want to see what work you can do, but it's, I would say almost equally as important to show you can get the job done. There's a grit factor involved and especially from editors that see a ton of pitches that the worst thing that can happen for them is that they invest into someone or give them that opportunity and then they don't come through. And so much of life is just showing up. So if you have a, a anything on your resume or portfolio that says, I can get this, this, and this done and I can do it quickly and it's going to be done well, they're going to be really impressed by that grit piece of it. That's exactly right. So there wasn't that specific example of a pitch to show, but we got the essentials and the types of things you need to share. So for some specific things um, for a photo project, of course, showing passion. And a lot of editors from what I saw talked about attaching photos to the email itself. But if you can't do that or they're too large and you're going to link, put the most important link first of either part of the project or work that you have done before, the first link, common sense, is most likely to be clicked. So you want to lead off with your strongest piece of info that you want them to take a look at if it's not attached. The attachments make it so easy to flip through when they're looking at an email, which is why that was a recommendation. And having a clear statement about your work and why you think it's worth getting the word out is is important and is what's really going to land with them. And there was a lot of mention of checking submission guidelines. So we're going to look at some of what that is, but keep that in mind that when you're pitching, you are not the first person that has pitched to them before. And there are some expectations that publications do have for anyone that will be pitching their work. So we'll, we'll look at what some of those are. And depending on what the project is, we're taught all the time and what I do in, in for the college that people are attracted to visuals. So if it's for a photo or if it's for graphic design and you have one stand out, I'm going to catch your attention with this visual. It's going to be the best thing you've ever seen. It's going to be why you look at this email. I think it can be appropriate to embed that pretty high up within the base of the email, but I will say I would have hesitancy to do that too frequently for the wrong projects. Uh, if it was going to be a journalism piece that you're writing a 3000 word essay on something, probably don't do that because it's not going to be relevant to the work. Mm-hmm. Right. So wrapping all of the specifics of the pitch up, top tips for any any of them, knowing what you're bringing to the table is what's going to be the most important. 
being able to concisely explain your vision for the work and what you are bringing to the table. An eye-catching subject line for the email, well, in addition to the visuals where appropriate, will be important. We're going to pull up these submission guidelines for both a, a writing one and a photo one. Where appropriate, mention where you've met someone or where you saw a call for the work, um, the person who shared your contact info. And if you do get the opportunity to pitch to someone at an industry event or a pitch fest, make sure you follow up with them. Make sure you get their contact info and then actually follow up so something can come of that pitch. And that will be the case. And I'm talking about entertainment specifically when we're talking about pitching in person, but there are opportunities to do that really for any, any major and any type of work that you're doing. So always make sure you're doing that follow up. So let's look at these guidelines. This is one for Format Magazine. So it's talking about being a contributor and it's talking about, you know, they're on the lookout for photographers, um, for writing. So there's multiple types of opportunities they're looking for. They're giving the overview that they pay, where to submit the pitch and what the timeline is that they'll try to adhere to to get back to you. But they're being really specific, which is great, of what they want you to include and including an estimated work count. That's going to be really important that you have a sense of what that is. They're talking about their voice and tone, reminding you that they may be edited and published at any time. And then they're sharing a little bit more about the magazine itself. So they're giving you, when we're talking about doing your research, this is all in one spot for you for this particular publication. Dane, does this track with some of the um, things that you've seen as well or any other tips you can add to that? It does. I will say that the magazine at format.com is a very general email. So there's a chance that's going to a lot of different people. Now, some publications, it's going to go to one person that checks that and that's fine. Um, but that's probably going to be a pretty wide open inbox. What I would do in this case is I would follow the instructions on here, but then I would probably go and try to find whether it's an editor or whether it is a person at the magazine. Um, their specific email for that one person and really tailor it to them and say, hey, I just submitted this for this. I saw that you've been working on this. I just wanted to say that I really liked how you did this. And your work here is what inspired me to want to submit some content to the magazine. So thanks for what you're doing. That one's like super short and sweet, but that gives you a person that you can talk to if you never hear back. Right. Absolutely. That's that's a great um, great tip. So this is a photography specific submission guideline. And I liked this one because it's getting very specific. And these are things for you to bear in mind as much as you can find this info. Um, you know, you know, the better it will be. So one, they're talking about that they have a specific theme and this is specifically F-stop, that's a photography magazine. So they're getting really specific, of course, on the photography because that's, that's really all, all that they do. Um, but they've got a theme. So if you have a particular project that you've been working on or thinking about, this is your, that relates to vacation, then, then that's your chance. And they're also submitting, um, accepting till tomorrow. So if anyone wants to get something together quickly and you've got a project, this is, this is your chance. Um, one submission per person. They're also giving you a look ahead for what their October, November is and, and that's landscape. So they're giving you the setup here, but they're really getting into the specifics about the type of um, files that they're looking for. And on the photography side, this is going to be really common. So it's something for you to keep in, in mind. Um, they're talking about 12 images, JPEG only. So definitely bear that in mind no watermarks. They have a specific way that they want you to name your file. These are really simple instructions in terms of being able to follow them. Um, that's going to make it easier and more likely that they will look at your submission and utilize it. They've got these guidelines for a reason. Um, it probably makes their life easier and it took many iterations of submissions probably being pretty hectic for them to want these very specific specifications. So do that as much as you can. They're talking about um, what the email should be, issue number and issue name, probably what's Dane, what Dane is saying, really easy to route it to the right people. And they want some additional information with your entry as well. So writing out titles, um, your contact information, they want to see your portfolio if you have one. So the other thing with photos and this will probably come up again in our next session. Our third and final session of the series will be August 4th, 
talking about taxes and contracts and billing. Um, things like copyright we'll, we'll be discussing in that next session, but it I think this is really common for photo submissions specifically to talk about copyright um, and basically how you're granting use of your images should you get published. So being aware of that, and they're talking about um, optimizing images for the web. I mean, they're giving you so many details of, of what they're looking for here. Copyright um, infringement is becoming more common with video as well as YouTube mm -hmm. continues to rise and more things get flagged on there. So let's say you had your portfolio on YouTube and some company comes to look at it and they see, oh, you've had four videos get flagged or pulled down for copyright violations. That's probably not going to look favorable on you because either you don't understand the copyright process or you don't care about it. And that the latter is even more scary for them uh, because as an individual level, there, you have no skin in the game. It doesn't cost you anything. When you get into the corporation level and have copyright violations, there's a lot of money and lawsuits involved that you don't want to be a part of and they don't want to be a part of. That's right. That's a really great point. Thank you for, for sharing that. And this is, yeah, of course, copyright info about what you're submitting. But yes, on the, on the flip side, too, if you've got a really great video that you've created and you are using music that was copyrighted and so YouTube's taking it down. Yeah, Dane's exactly right. It's something that you need to be aware of on all sides, how your work is being used. And again, we're getting jumping ahead a little bit to some of that contract work or some of the submission work here. Um, but also when, when you are creating actual work too, that you might be using someone else's copyrighted work is very important that you all are aware of that. that that's a really great point. I so, wanted to mention too, at the yeah. top, it was the timeline that they had for their, their deadlines here. Understand that so many Many different outlets have different kinds of timelines. I, I learned this uh, when I was working at the PR firm where some magazines are quarterly and so they'll work a few months out. Some work a year and a half out and they put that much into it. Uh, but if you're going for a digital social media job, they're pruning out content every five minutes. And so there's just different levels of what you need to do. For those interested in screenwriting, you may be looking at something that's not happening for two years. And so you'll be involved in that process from there. Take a look at how often whatever outlet you're uh, applying to publishes content, period. Uh, and then how far back they need to have that runway to be able to get there. Because in some cases, it's multiple years. In some cases, it's multiple minutes. And what you can do for them to achieve those goals uh, is going to be helpful. I always say if you can apply earlier in an application process, you have a better chance. Uh, because I just think it looks bad when you're waiting for the last day, because maybe that's how they're going to perceive that you're going to be when you work. That's exactly right. Yes, you're so right about all the timelines too. Um, similar to social, if you're pitching writing and content to a blog, that could get posted way more quickly than a print magazine. So yeah, that, that's a really great point. So let's get back to the PowerPoint and wrap up here before we do some questions. So we'll do, like I said, simple overview of pricing your work. And the reason I say that is because, like I said, session three will be August 4th, and we're going to talk about taxes, contracts, and billing. We're going to try to pull in some of our um, folks from our alumni network to talk with you about that, that have some um, strong experience with that. So this is an overview of the basics of what you might expect, ways to do some research on rates. Um, Take this info, look at the resources that we're going to share in our follow-up email, and we'll also include them in the um, video notes on the YouTube that we post, and then come with questions to that next session if you've got some specifics. But here, here's your simple overview. This is really similar to salary negotiation for what we would talk about for an annual salary. Again, if, if that's the direction that you go, you need to do your research. So look um, at rates that are typically being charged by freelancers in your field with resources like Glassdoor, Upwork, Fiverr. Um, Glassdoor is a general career resource. They have salary info, you know, rate info. They also have interview questions. They have got a little bit of everything. Upwork and Fiverr are freelance specific, project specific websites that I think will be helpful for you all to take a look at. As a beginner freelancer, which I think we all are because that's what the series is, is about getting started in freelancing. You might select a lower rate than what you're seeing and build up over time. 
It's also important to know what your standards are for your geographic location. So of course, a big part of freelancing might be an element of when you're getting started in the entertainment industry, you might want to start on cruise. And that is freelance work. It's a little bit different than some of this other work that we're talking about with, say, pitching your own project but you, you might be on set and, and that is freelance, you know, work that you're doing on a crew, LA and Atlanta rates are likely going to differ. Not by all that much on the PA side from some of the research that I did, but there will be a little bit of a difference there. So, so be aware of that. Also understanding how rates can be presented or established. So on the entertainment side, if you are doing that, um, like type of crew work, PA work, you're going to see a dollar amount slash a number. That means the rate for a 10 hour day or 12 hour day is typically what you're going to end up seeing. So you might see like 225 10 and then that's a 10 hour day for, for that amount. So if you ever see that, that's what that means. On the journalism side, it can be per word. You might see something like 20 cents for beginners up to a dollar for people with experience per word. Um, Dane, is that tracking with some of what you're seeing? Do you, do you see per word or hourly or, or both? Um, it's usually more magazines and okay. I guess like really high dollar uh, and I guess they're like journalism magazines at that point when you start thinking of like the New Yorker and things like that. Um, yeah, it, it would be per word, which eventually they would kind of equate to per project and they just have a certain amount of words allocated for that particular publication. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. So yeah, you might see um, per project or hourly, hourly you know, very likely or per project for writing, definitely design, marketing, editing, maybe photo in, in some cases as well. I think you definitely see either of these depending on the type of work that you're doing on the photo side. But one of our guests from our session one um, did for on the photo side did like event photography. So that would be potentially like a project rate. So something for you to keep in mind. And something that you might choose to establish as well is a project or package rate or a flat fee. So you might offer one set of services based on how long it will take for you to complete the work or complete the project, regardless of you know, the type of content that is. If you are doing something with clients, I think a really good best practice would be for you to keep in mind that your project fee, if you do that, can also include support communication and you give them support, whether it's a you know, one hour meeting a month, or three emails a month. And then if they go over that, because clients will go over that and probably um, try to ask you a lot of questions and take up a lot of your time, then you can bill hourly based on a rate um, that you from your research that is appropriate for you. And when you're building that package fee or, or flat rate fee, um, your hourly rate can, can be in mind for that. Um, from what I've seen, again, especially on the client side, so our folks more on the ad PR um, design side, web design, you know, whatever that is, um, clients don't always know how long it takes you to do your work. So you want to present that package because they might way overestimate if you just give them an hourly rate. They might not have any idea how long it takes you and think that it's way too expensive or something that they're not going to be able to do. Um, so if you can package it for them on the front end with this is what you're getting for this amount, that gives them, gives them a much better sense of what they're getting and establishes boundaries, which is really important as a freelancer. Again, you might have clients that are asking you a ton of questions. You might not have too much back and forth with an editor, but when you're working with a client on say building a website for them or writing their website content for them, they might have a ton of questions. So if you can provide some of that support up front and then bill for your time, which is important when you're a freelancer because time really is money for all of you something for you to keep in mind there. In your research for companies, take the time to learn how they make their money and then how they're structured on the business side of it. If you're applying for a place that has an HR department and certain standards, I work at the University of Georgia in my job with the college. They can't just out and say, oh, I want to give you a, a, an 8% raise. No, there are standards in place, laws in place that they have, their procedures and protocols um, that save what they do there. My side gig, however, as uh, the sports reporter for UGASports.com, on its face, it looks like that would be for Rivals.com, which is a big company that would have all those protocols. Well, what I learned is that the publisher of the individual site that I write for has an LLC 
which he is then licensed to use Rivals for that. So I don't get paid from Rivals. I get paid from his personal business LLC, and then he has all the risk with Rivals involved there. So what looked like a multi-thousand people company really is a 12-person company. And so if he decides that he wants to give me a raise, great. But that also means that I don't know what that starting point is on what I was worth in the conversations at the beginning. So we didn't talk money until the last second. And I made him throw out the first dollar. He would say, well, what are you thinking? And I said, I really don't know. I would kind of lean on where your head is there. Now, if he would have lowballed something that wasn't worth my time, I would negotiate it back. He didn't do that. And so that's one way to think about how can, how is this organization making money? And then once you get to that point that you're talking, you can use your entrepreneurial brain to say, how can I help you make more money? So in our case, their YouTube channel was not monetized. Well, three years ago, they hired me. And within the process in the last few years, it is monetized. And now there's a revenue source that wasn't there before I arrived. So if you can make money for them, I just got a raise there three months ago. I'm just saying. Awesome. That's great. That's a, that's a really great point too, especially for, um, and that's journalism. Um, but those of you that, that are on that ad PR marketing side, and that's also might be how your brain works, looking for those opportunities too with organizations and publications are great. So that's excellent. Okay. So I want to make sure that you all leave with action items for all of these sessions. And so, like I said, there will be a lot of resources for you to review that we'll make sure that we share but some ideas for pitching and submitting your work. And I'll make sure that you all um, get the slides as well. So you can click on some of these links that I have here. Um, But the contemporary is a, um, is is accepting student pitches. They specifically work with um, college students and they've got a form that you fill out where you can, you know, tell them about yourself and then pitch a specific story idea. Um, there are going to be a ton of those kinds of opportunities, both on and off campus for those of you on the writing and photo side. Um, so look for those opportunities. That's how you get started, um, getting some of your work out there for those of you that again, are on the photo side and especially for the entertainment side, be aware of student and industry competitions. I think there's a culture of that in in all of our departments, um, especially on, you know, for our photo students and on the EMST side. I know we've had some students in recent years and semesters win some really great, um, you know, contests and festivals that, you know, they've joined and been a part of. Be aware of that and do that and start getting your work out there and see how it's being received and fine tune how you're talking about your work. So pitch festivals and film festivals. Um, Screencraft is, has a popular virtual pitch competition. Um, Austin Film Festival has multiple tracks. It also includes digital series and even um, submitting a script for a fiction podcast. So there's a lot of different ways that you could get your work out there and submit work regardless of, of what you're creating. There is, of course, the MPPA Student Quarterly Clip Contest for um, photographers, College Student Photographer of the Year. Start getting your work out there and also keeping in mind um, that some of these competitions, they might not be paid unless you're getting a, there might be a potential prize. So some of it is just about the love of the work and getting it out there. But that's also how you start building a name for yourself and can show some of those results on your portfolio when you are doing pitching pitches to future um, folks and start with your connections. So can you offer, for those of you um, on the ad PR marketing side, um, can you offer any of your services to friends and families? Maybe it's even student orgs or, or other groups that you work with. Maybe it's a part-time job and you want to tack on some of what you do for the business. It's social media, more communications for them. But think about how you can start um, getting your work out there and have some really great samples for that portfolio that we talked about. One idea too, is if there's an internship or uh, an opportunity that you want and you, you just don't know anyone in that sphere, try to find who had it last year. Uh, because if they're not actively present there, they can at least guide you. Oh, here's the things that worked well that I liked. Here's the things I didn't. That's where, especially if you're in the same age group around college age, I think it's really appropriate to reach out LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and, and invest and see if that's a person from another campus that you can work with, because you'll probably become in that same network that way. Awesome. Great. 
Okay, time for Q&A for anyone that has questions for us. And I will go ahead and stop screen sharing. Okay, we'll take questions in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself and ask those questions and we are happy to answer them if you all have them. Okay. Wait, I have a quick question. Sounds so good. I started my, um, I'm a freelancer and I'm a social media manager and I started it. And one of the things that I'm struggling with is undercharging. And it's just because like, I'm new, I'm starting out, I'm nervous. Um, and I feel like if I set my prices too high, I'm not getting clients. What are your like advice on that? Cause I know like it fluctuates based on like experience. So like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think at some point you have to understand that like one, you have value that you're bringing, right? And your portfolio would show that if you're finding that you're not getting clients and you think it's because of the price, then maybe you lower it on the next couple of pitches and, and see how that works. The other thing is it's always appropriate, I think, to ask uh, someone in a business relationship, oh, you, you know, we didn't work together on this. I'm trying to get feedback to see why. I'm trying to see if there's something that I can improve on um, or something that you were looking for that I didn't offer. Um, so that way that either in a future relationship that we have or in uh, a future opportunity that I have that I can serve clients better in that way. So, you know, if, if you have an opportunity that didn't go through and you think it's because of the pricing, try to get feedback from them to inform that for you. And I think most people, if you come at it uh, in a humble way, will be appreciative to tell you why they didn't go with that. I, I, I think, okay, so like I have a client and like I just sent like a business proposal and everything and he wants me to build him a website, which is fine because I do that too. But like, he's just saying like less is better. And like, and I'm just like, well, well, I mean, I'm in this group called like women in marketing on Facebook and people are like, it's usually like 50 an hour, like between like 30 to 50 an hour to build a website. And he's like, not, he wants like a complex, like at least like 12 pages. And he's like, I'll pay a thousand. He was like, since you're like new. And I'm just like, I don't know. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm in the point where like, I'm eager to get clients and like, you know, like start my business. But at the same time, like, should I settle for less now just to gain the experience and like get the testimonial that I need to put on my website and then go from there and then start charging more in the future? Or should I just be like, no, it's not worth my time. So of course that's up to you. I will say that if that's how the relationship is starting, be aware of how this person might be as a client over time. So when we're talking about what I was talking about earlier of giving that project rate, this is the flat fee, this is what I'm giving you for this amount. It is to set boundaries um, with clients who might want you to provide more to them than they are willing to pay for. And that is not something that I think for your own sake that you should um, accept to tell you the truth. I don't think you should necessarily settle for less. So it sounds to me like this is a negotiation opportunity. So for what it sounds, what I'm hearing is that what this person is willing to pay is way below what he is asking. So can you work backwards a little bit and think about what project are you able to produce in the $1,000 range? And he can take it or leave it at that. Well, the other, have you, do you know how many hours it would take you to do the full project that he's asking? Yeah, I sent over a questionnaire and it's probably going to take me about two, two or three full weeks if I'm working like seven hours because he has like his business and he wants to incorporate 501c into it and like have all these forms and he wants me to start with HTML, CSS. He doesn't want me to use any template like from scratch. So I'm just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so, okay. So there will also be a point, is he considering retaining you over time as well? Because the thing about using a WordPress and building on a site like that is because you can then hand it over to the client and don't always have to be the middle person. So what yeah, I asked him about that. I was like, well, if you, if I'm just going to do it and then pass it on to, for you to, for maintenance, so I don't have to keep, keep up with it. Right. He was just like, well, he's like, I want to start small, but I want you to have the, 
the skeleton of it first and then we'll continue to build so he's mm-hmm. just like i think he wants to keep me long term so he said because starting out he was just willing to pay only a thousand but a thousand is like three pages maybe less <laughs> Right. And I think it's okay for you to say that Um, I I wouldn't take less for that particular project, especially because, I mean, if you're talking minimum, what you just said of seven hours a day for two weeks, it's going to be 70 hours that you have invested in it. If I work 70 hours, I want to make more than a thousand dollars. And I'm sure that you're worth that too, based on even the little bit that you just told me. So I think Samantha's got a good point. You can go back and say, okay, if a thousand dollars is the max budget you have, this is how the project's going to need to be able to change. Uh, And here's some ideas I have that we can accomplish some of those same goals that you had. And if later on you want to add to it, I'm happy to do that. Um, That's that's the negotiation there. And if he says all or nothing, then you may have just avoided someone that would have been a bigger headache for you. Um, And yet that's at the cost of a bit of portfolio. But you can create similar websites for the portfolio. What you can't do is uh, get that time back. That's one thing that people don't understand how, is how valuable your time is. And if you're spending two to three weeks invested in this particular project, that means that there's other things that you aren't working on that may be better opportunities. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, both of y'all. You're welcome. Any other questions that we can help you all with before we end here? Okay. Well, we'll end it here and we're just up on our one hour time frame, So that was great timing. If you all have any follow-up questions, please feel free to email me. My email is sam610sam610 at uga.edu. And we will send for everyone who is registered um, the follow-up information as well as the link to our third and final session of our series. Great. And Dane, thank you all for joining. Thank you. Have a good nice day. Thank you. Thank y'all. Hope you all have a good day. Thanks for joining and we will share more info soon. Bye.